Hi everyone, this is Joan, and I hope, sincerely hope, that you are having a wonderful day, and that yesterday, the Sabbath, that you had a wonderful and prayerful day. Well, um, what I wanted to say now is that, well, you know, I have a problem with Facebook. I don't know what it is, but I think the whole concept just is like, why should I put my information here and tell you who I know. Why would I do that? And I, I guess that's an old school notion, but I did open up a Facebook page or whatever under my name, Joan Jones. And um, I joined a lot of Hebrew Israelite groups because I'm trying to reach, in particular, the women. I'm not trying to turn the women against the men. I'm trying to tell the women that the, the Heavenly Father is not against you and that when you really read the scriptures it's not even telling you that the Heavenly Father or his son are against you if anything you have been defended now you have been you have been defended the everybody pretty much in that garden got cursed but even so there were special provisions put up for you and even with a curse, I've often thought that the Heavenly Father, people think that when He curses people that He makes things happen. I don't think all the time. I think some of the time when He curses you, He allows things to happen to you that He might have blocked otherwise. Now, I, I cannot explain why Adam was like he was, but I do think the Bible has been telling us especially us people who were raised in Christian churches and kingdom halls and stuff. The Bible has put it, put it plainly what kind of men you're going to be dealing with. So I did this video, Sons of Adam, Daughters of Eve, and I used the words in the Bible, simple words that Adam said. When he was confronted by the Most High for what he had done or allowed to happen, he said, that woman. Okay, now, when you talk to any, well, not any, but a lot of black men, and you ask them about the problems that are going on in the black community, what are they going to say? That woman. Did I make that up? No. It's only two words. Is it difficult to understand? No. I, I don't understand what the problem is, except that black women in particular really like being treated badly. I mean, I was treated badly, and I truly didn't like it. I I fought every way I could, but and that is why I'm here, because I don't want people, anyone, to go through what I went through. I, I really don't. I know what it's like to feel boxed in. When I was married, I made the mistake of marrying my ex-husband. I knew he didn't have much, but uh, I had been with other men who were trying to buy me. And I recognize now that's a much better deal. But at the time, I thought, okay, well, he has been through what I've been through. My family hates my guts and treats me like garbage. And he says the same for his family so you know what we can get together and we can build from the bottom up we will be a power couple that was what I thought he had something totally different in line and you have to recognize that the Heavenly Father will put good people in your life the devil will put will put bad people in your life and the thing is, when you see people, even when you have interacted with them for a while, it's difficult to tell which is which. Because you're told from the TV and such that good people always come to you smiling. And you're told that anybody who comes and has a problem or, or says something negative to you is a bad person. And that is not necessarily the case. Sometimes a good person is coming to you screaming, saying, stop doing that. I remember I was walking down the street with my oldest daughter when she was like three. And we didn't have a car because, like I said, I married a poor, horrible man. 
But anyway, we didn't have a car. So I am holding a bag of groceries and holding her hand at the same time. You know, so we come to a intersection and I'm trying to hold on and she decides to bolt and run and I start screaming. Now, I'm screaming because this is a street. You, you can't do that. You have to listen to me. You have to, you are depending on me to keep you safe. You have to listen to me and do what I say, period. So, I did not come to her and say, Oh, little sweet, beautiful little kid, don't run out in the street. No, I screamed. Now, I didn't curse at her because I don't, generally, I'm not that big on cursing. But the point is, I did scream at her. So, sometimes someone is screaming at you because they love you. They're trying to keep you safe. Other times, people are coming to you and they are smiling and pleasant and nice initially. And sometimes that initially can last a long time. You could be married to somebody or be good friends with someone or so you think for years before they really come out and show you that they've hated your guts all the time. That is why my philosophy is I only stick around for the honeymoon phase. So I'm not too worried about are you a narc or not a narc. I worry about if you're violent. But beyond that, um, my thing is, once you let me know you not for me, I'm out. I, I, don't, I believe, personally, you do exactly what the Savior told you to do. He said, put the Most High above everything and everyone. Then love everyone else based on how you love yourself. If I don't curse me out, I'm not letting somebody else curse me out. I'm not going to fight with them, but I'm not going to stick around. If I'm not physically or emotionally abusing me, I'm not going to stick around for anybody else to. So if a narcissist comes and they're smiling, pretty much like the serpent was in the garden, and they're saying, yo, child, you know, what are you talking about? This is, you know, the Heavenly Father is not for you. He just doesn't want you to be like him. Well, uh, that is someone who hates your guts, and they are trying to kill you. They recognize that they aren't going to last very much longer. They see that you have a choice. Sorry, you have a chance. Well, you have both. You have a choice and a chance. And they're smiling at you to try to get you to make the wrong decision. And that is what happened in that garden. But back to Facebook. The reason why I brought them up is because, like I said, I joined Hebrew Israelite groups because, like I said, it's a a black girl party, but anybody's welcome to come. So I'm trying to reach black women because, like I said, I sat in the Kingdom Hall and I listened to them about how women were second class citizens, pretty much that's what they say. And... Uh, I went home and it was like, wait a minute, mom does not seem like she's that. Even though she would say, oh no girl, uh, you supposed to do what your husband say. And then I'd look at her with my father battling it out and thinking, oh wait a minute, something's not quite right here. And anyway, it's just not logical that the Heavenly Father would give you a brain if you were never supposed to use it. I believe that it's kind of like when you are on a job. They try very hard to get the person who, get the right person for the job. In which case, I believe that men and women were retrofitted for the particular job that the Heavenly Father had for them to, to live out. But back to Facebook. Let me just say it point blank before I go on to something else. I, I have posted that video sons of Adam, daughters of Eve, and a, a couple of administrators on the different groups. I didn't post it on all of them, just on the ones particular to black women or to Hebrew Israelite women. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't let them sh play. And I'm like, but I did not, I, I, this is exactly what the Bible said. I didn't make this up. I mean, and it's not difficult to you can talk to men on the street 
or you can read their information. Definitely go on a Hebrew Israelite mail site. Doesn't have to be particularly male, but when people when people think about Hebrew Israelite, they automatically think of the men, not the women, because they they don't think too much of the women. But uh, I I did not violate anything. I simply said this is what the Bible says, and it's not like it's difficult to find that particular scripture. It's right up there almost as soon as you open the Bible. So I don't know. It's a uh, it's a strange world to me, and even though I read about how it's going to be strange in the end, living through it is something way different than uh, reading about it. So maybe that is what the difficulty is. But like I said, I'm not saying anything that isn't written right there. So the point is, maybe the major point I've been trying to make with these videos is don't blame the Most High. Don't blame His Son, our Savior. They have been telling you what happened. You have been warned. The Savior gave you an example, gave you some examples on how women were to be treated, but you go to these churches and kingdom halls and they don't adhere to it. And the Kingdom Hall will even tell you, well, you only read what we tell you to read. Now, you know, they want you or they allow you to read the Bible. But to me, anybody who tells me, don't check up on what I'm saying is somebody you need to definitely check up on what they're saying. So, I don't know. To me, it's very, very odd. The only thing I can figure is that some women like being abused or they're just simply accustomed to it. Now, I can look at my life and say, well, I was raised by, I was raised in an extremely narcissistic family. And now I'm beginning to understand that they were also, they are still involved in a lot of witchcraft. So I'm used to being treated in a, I'm used to being told, you can't do this, you don't do this, you did this wrong, you shouldn't have done that. An example is, I told you when I was in high school, I got, I got into an altercation with a very light-skinned girl because I came into the classroom. She was sitting behind me. I thought we were friends, or at least, you know, we had, we were cool. So when I came in the room, I was carrying my books. I turned around to say good morning and put the books on her desk. I was not planning on leaving them there. There was nothing else on her desk. I was just saying good morning. So she took my books and threw them across the room. Now, I came from, that was a very uh, exclusive high school, but I came from a very ghetto grammar school. Well, middle school, rather. Grammar school was okay. It was that middle school that was horrible. So, in that middle school, you had to understand, if somebody throws your books across the room, unless you want to be jumped on by everybody else in this classroom, you better defend yourself. So, um... I'm a, uh, I was a, a brown skinned girl, didn't come from a rich background, so everybody hated me. I mean, I was hated by the students, by the teachers, that was four years of hell. But for whatever reason, I would not transfer out, I, I just put up with it. So, that is not the best background to study in, so my grades were horrible also. So, uh, when I got into this exclusive high school, because I had good test scores, I was, uh, when I got into, sorry, when I got into college, I was kind of shocked that they let me in. And I applied to the same college my father had attended. But, like I said before, my mother was like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make the kids hush so he can study. I don't want him to study. I don't want him to to get this license because I think that he might it just won't be beneficial to me. So he didn't he did two years. Then my oldest sister was a, a valedictorian. So she got a four year ride. Um, but she got pregnant and dropped out. So when they let me when they admitted me to this school, to me it was like family honor. Okay, they didn't, 
get to attend, I'm going to attend and I'm going to finish it. But at the same time, my grades had been so low, I really didn't know that I would be able. I was shocked when they let me in. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to uh, compete. So when the first semester was over and I got all B's, I was so proud. Like, my God, you I'm not just totally dumb. I mean, I can do this. And that was the one time I showed my mom my grades and my brother came in. My brother is 12 years, 12 years older than I am. So he came in and I was like, look, I got all these. And he said, wow, that's too bad. And I'm like, what? Well, yeah, that's too bad because people who make, who get B's are failures in life because they aren't smart enough to get A's and they don't party enough to get a gentleman C. So that just means you are not all that bright and you also are not all that popular. And I never showed anybody my grades after that. And I always remembered it. And I've always felt like, I don't know, maybe I'm just faded. But uh, the point is, so after that, after I graduated, and you would think that that would make things a little different, but no, it didn't. But anyway, after I graduated, I dated a few years, and then I met my ex-husband. I had already decided that maybe marriage wasn't for me, because I looked at my older sisters. I'm the youngest, and I thought, you know what? I don't see where this really benefits you any, so I, I think I'll just be the old maid aunt. That sounds like a good fit. But then my family started saying, what's wrong with her? She, she, she's not consistently with anybody. She, why she got no permanent boyfriend? Something wrong with her. We need to look at her a little harder. So, okay. I also, well, so I married my ex-husband. Now it wasn't like I disliked him, but that madly romantic stuff that they show on TV, I didn't feel that either. I, I liked him okay. I liked talking to him. And I felt like finally somebody to talk to who understands what I've been through. But um, he may have understood, but he was out to exploit, not to assist. And that is the point I'm making. That when a person comes from a background where they have been oppressed or subjugated, and they have been made to think that this is normal. If you open that cage and let them out, they're going to go try to find the same thing because it's all they know. They don't know how to be treated well. They don't know that they're not being treated well. I didn't know my ex-husband was not treating me well until I had a friend. She was a Pisces with an Aries moon and her Thing. I always remember she used to always say, don't say no to yourself. Just at least get out there and try to ask, but don't say no to yourself. So she was the one who, now, she was not trying to tell me anything. This was just a regular conversation we were having. And she was saying, yeah, my husband bought me, he's always buying me this jewelry. And, you know, a lot of times I don't like it. So when he's not paying attention, I take it back to the store and I get the money and then I buy what I really want. And my thought was, and I didn't say it out loud, but my thought was, he buys you things? I mean, geez, this fool, I can't hardly even get him. He bought with me because I bought a 26 cent pack of gum once. And I'm like, wow, your husband actually buys you? Now, I know you're thinking, how stupid were you? Well, very stupid, but when I was growing up, a lot of people are living very unusual lives, and that's one of the reasons why I've always had the philosophy that I try to be kind to people. Because when I see you, I don't know what, you, what you're going through. I don't know what mud hole you might have had to walk through in order to stand in front of me that particular day. So I try to be kind to people. But when I was growing up, because we were Jehovah's Witnesses, I was... I was not allowed to go to parties. I was not really invited to parties. We did not have visitors. When my father left, 
We were kicked out of the hall, so I couldn't talk to the people at the hall. But then again, when I went to school, couldn't talk to them either because they looked at me like, well, you're one of them crazy Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm in a limbo, limbo land, and my family ignored me. Pretty much I didn't exist except to say, yeah, she, she's, she's antisocial. She, she don't talk to nobody. You don't talk to me. I don't understand how this is supposed to work. So other people have memories of going to after school programs or going to friends' houses or this party here or I never had any of that. I didn't have any of that. My life was the most normal it ever was when I was in college. So my ex-husband well, also, you know, the hall, you follow the Ten Commandments. I was not sleeping around, even in college. I dated a little bit, just a little bit, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't too much out there. And, you know, my family even had something to say about that. It was either you're a whore or you're gay. It's kind of like I can't win with these crazy people. So I did not have much to compare when it came to looking at a perspective need. And I'm saying that I think that that is the case with a lot of, a lot of black women. I mean, I, I think that my case is extreme. You know, I used to think I am the closest a person can come to having been raised in solitary confinement. But black women have been told, don't, date out and don't question us and you don't even have to read the bible just take our word for it because we are superior can't you tell we're superior we have bigger muscles we can knock you out so black women can't say well you know what that hispanic guy over there was much nicer to me than you or you know what that other guy over there he was much nicer to me than you or you know I don't have to put up with this. I know I can find somebody else. Black women don't really have that because it's kind of like you've been raised in a vacuum. So I can't really take it too personal when people don't want to hear what I'm trying to tell you. But the way my life has been, the only reason, the only sense I can make of it is that I'm supposed to tell you. I didn't go through all this for nothing. And I feel like, and I, I pray that the Heavenly Father corrects me if I'm wrong, but this is my mission, or at least part of my mission. So even if I can only get one person to hear me, one black woman to open the Bible and to just read what the Savior said, hey, Heavenly Father comes first. You love the neighbor as you love yourself. So who have you got to love first? Yourself. Okay? If you are not mistreating you, nobody else is supposed to mistreat you. That's a simple message, but it has been extremely difficult getting black women to hear it. I kind of think everybody else knows it, but it's like I said, I myself was raised in kind of solitary confinement. That's why any friend I had meant a lot to me. I mean, because I don't have anybody else. I don't have a family that's going to back me up. I, my children meant the world to me. I, I, like I said, I got punched out by my ex-husband while I was holding the baby. And I, I believe in fighting back. I may not win, but you know, we're going to have an understanding here. He understood that about me, so he did it. When I'm in my most vulnerable state, I'm holding the baby. I'm trying to protect the baby. So, please um, listen to what I'm saying. Please like, share, and subscribe. Please uh, comment and let me know what you think. And if you think that this message might help any, especially a black woman, to understand that this is not the father or the son's fault. This is not. The Heavenly Father sent his son through a woman, and part of what he did was give you this warning. Cry for yourselves. 
This is beyond a warning. It's almost a commandment. Cry for yourselves and your children. Remember when you listen to a black man cry about community is your fault. You ugly. You fat. You stupid. You masculine. He's only doing what Adam did. What did Adam say? Is that woman? Okay. What did Adam done before that? He hid. He hid behind a tree. So when you look at your men and you're wondering, was it something I said? Was it something I did? No, he's just being himself. This is what they are when they aren't trying to be better. And as long as you accept them as they are and don't, don't show that you will not accept being treated like less than a fellow human being, well, then they're going to continue to do it. Plus, I, I think that Adam made a decision that what he saw in Genesis 1 was better than what he saw in Genesis 2. And he was willing to sacrifice Genesis 2 for Genesis 1. This is just something to think about. And uh, I know that I'm not saying things that pretty much anybody else can will say to you. But I am doing this because I do truly care. I feel like I have, like it's an old Madonna song, I made it through the wilderness, and I'm trying to tell you how to make it through too. I'm a, I'm like the last few years of the baby boomers. And you can look at your mothers and grandmothers and say, well, y'all were some dumb so-and-sos. These men walked all over you. Well, you know, our men were not killing us back then. So we didn't, we, it just wasn't as bad. And I can say, like I said, I'm pointing out from the Garden of Eden, men have always been troublesome, always, period. Point blank, that's just how it is. But for the most part, they were not killing you. When I was coming up, you could pretty much date anybody on the block. You could. And you knew who you were dating. You knew that, okay, those guys over there, shoot, it's like five of them in one family, and they all look good, and they go to the, they go find the prettiest women they can find, and they will punch them out. Now, you can remember that. I can remember that really well because that was rare. Nobody else was punching their girlfriends out. Okay, you you could pick anybody else within that radius, and you knew you could go out on a date with them. The most bad thing that was going to happen is maybe they didn't have much money to buy you too much of anything. But for the most part, Besides possibly conversation you might not like, they weren't going to hurt you, not physically. So your grandmother, your mother are looking at this world and it is something that is totally different. It's, it's very different. It's, uh, like I said, the percentages are what totally changed. Let's say by the time the 60s, came along, let's say 50% of the black men were, like they said, undateable. Or at least you could date them, just don't marry them. Okay, that was in the 60s. But then you get to the 80s and maybe it's like 40% are marriage marriageable. I'm not even saying a great marriage, but one that you don't, that is not affecting you negatively, physically or mentally. Okay, then you get to the 2000s, and by now people have had a few years of rap music and hearing about how these itches ain't ain't uh, loyal, even though black women are the most loyal people there are, and uh, all kinds of other negative things. And maybe now you're down to 20% of these men you can actually marry, and they're going to recognize that you are also a human being. Then you get to... Uh, 2020 and I really think it has gone down to about five percent so I'm not saying I don't recognize that there aren't some marriageable black men I'm just saying there's not very many and I'm saying that it's not that your grandmother or your mother was any stupider than anybody else it's just that the world she was going and dating in was not the same world 
so if it's the heavenly father's will i will keep making videos i will keep trying to warn you i will keep trying to encourage you that you are not less than you are different you have a different purpose but you are not less than and stop i'm asking you to please consider to question the things that you uh, you have been told and see if they make any kind of logical sense from a loving God. That is also what really made me start studying and one of the things because I kept looking at, wait a minute, God is love. The Most High is love. Why would he put some people down here, give them a brain and then say, don't use it though, use his. But what if he's stupid? Well, you should have thought about that before he you married him. How was I supposed to know he was stupid? I mean, there were only certain situations I could look at him in just dating him. Oh, well, you're a second-class citizen, but you are supposed to be smarter than everyone else. What? That does not make logical sense. No, that that is why I started, one of the reasons why I started studying it for myself not saying that i would ever argue with the most high because i know the most high is always correct which is why my emphasis is on what did the savior say what did he do did he call women out of their names well he did call that greek woman a um um well in any case uh, what happened with them was that they worshiped the dog star so when he called her a female dog He's basically calling her a female who worships the dog star, which is why she did not get upset over what he said. But as far as did the Savior say anything cruel or hateful, especially to his own women? No. And he made a point of warning his own women in a crowd of men and women. He did not point out black men and say, Yo, black man or Hebrew Israelite man, it's, it's that woman's fault. She did it. No, he did not. He did pretty much the opposite. He looked at the women and said, Hey, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves and your children. Again, he did not mention grown men anywhere in there. So why are you so quick to listen to them cry? They have not been commanded to cry. You have. So anyway, this is just something to think about. You guys have a great rest of your day.